Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Remarkable Journeys. Um, before we get into the program, I just want to go over a few of the details. Um, let you know that um, we will be taking questions and answers at the end of the program. So if you want throughout the program, um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A section. And if you just click on that, you can go ahead and type in your questions and then I will read them out at the end of our program um, and you can get your questions answered then. Um, and now I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Stefana, and she will introduce our program tonight. There you go, Stefana. Thank you, Constance. Um, we're delighted this evening to have Richard Runs with us. Um, it feels like Richard has become a friend to us now. Um, last year, we journeyed to Manzanar in the southeastern part of California, and he was also an exhibiting uh, photographer for, for our Art in the Library program. So we've gotten to work together on a number of programs, and, and I always find him very interesting and well-versed in his, in his topic. Tonight, he will be talking about something that is near and dear to his heart. As a young boy, he enjoyed the nighttime heavens. He received his first telescope at, at about age eight. And since then, observing the skies has become a lifetime passion for him. Tonight, he's going to take us to two observatories Mount Wilson in Southern California and Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. He will explore some of their history and contributions to astronomy. It's my pleasure to introduce Richard Bruns. Go ahead, Richard, it's, it's your turn. Wow, wow, nice introduction, thank you. And I just discovered I've been pronouncing your name incorrectly all this time. Thank you for that, Constance. Uh, Welcome uh, to this presentation uh, on something that, as Stefana said, is dear and dear to my heart. At the age of about eight, I announced to the world that I was going to become a professional astronomer. I'm not sure where I got the idea, probably from reading science fiction. But for the next few years, I dedicated myself to learning the planets the satellites, the constellations, and all kinds of information that was available at the time. Uh, my first telescope was a little 2.4 inch refractor uh, that my mom gave me for Christmas in Baker, Montana, which had very nice dark skies. From there, I went to a six inch reflecting telescope a few years later. That was the eighth grade in Long Beach, California. And because of that telescope, my high school or my junior high school teacher, Mr. Hughes agreed to sponsor our astronomical club, which we called the Tycho Astronomical Society. And that's how I got introduced to Mount Wilson. That was our only field trip and we took our tel my telescope and Mr. Hughes telescope and the members of our little club and we went to Mount Wilson to spend the night observing the stars and planets and it was it was killer it was a wonderful night so I kept going with astronomy until the 10th grade at Mar Vista High School in Imperial Beach California what happened there was I discovered chemistry, physics, mathematics, statistics were not my friend. Uh, I did not have the innate ability to, to make logical and illogical leaps into astronomy that the math and science required. So I kind of gave up and became an English teacher or not an English teacher, but an English major. In Long Beach, there were a number of telescope companies that uh, I used to bike to. Uh, there was Tom Cave's uh, Cave Optical, and there were Trekker Scopes, and they were both within biking distance, but I chose the Cave Astrola for my six inch reflector. Now this was a pretty big deal for an eighth grader. Uh, it was a whopping 200 bucks 
Uh, the equivalent today is about 900. Uh, you can see in this image the type of scope I had. The one with the young lady there with the white tube, that's a 12 inch. That was the, that was the holy grail for amateur astronomers. Uh, I was on the way to there, but uh, that math and the science and so forth kind of stopped it. I kept up my efforts so, and I, I produced a few images uh, that I'm pretty happy with. Uh, above on the top line is, is the lunar eclipse we had a few days ago or a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the next line down is the solar eclipse. Uh, I drove to Casper, Wyoming to shoot that. And that was a pretty terrific trip. Uh, bottom left is an annular eclipse. That's where the moon passes between the earth and the sun, but it's too far away to completely block out the light. Uh, so we get a ring of fire, they call it. In the middle is a first quarter moon, my best photo of the moon I've ever taken. And to the right of that is a little black dot in the face of the sun. What that is is the planet Venus and it passes in front of the sun twice uh, within a few years and then it doesn't do it again for many years. Uh, this happened one in 2005, I think it was, and then again about five years ago. Now, my wife, Judy, noticed in a Facebook post by Dr. Michelle Fowler that there was a special new program going on at Mount Wilson. That program was a tour and an evening of looking through this 100-inch telescope, uh, a dream come true. Uh, Dr. Thaler is an astronomer. You may have seen her on television. She uh, talks on some of the science documentaries about astrophysics, astronomy, rocket science, and that kind of thing. Uh, she's brilliant and very articulate and very personably charming. And because of her, my wife bought me a tour as a gift. Now, George Hillary, Ellery Hale and Percival Lowell, the founder of the two observatories, observatories we're going to visit today, uh, essentially, between the two of them, changed the face of the cosmos or our understanding of it. George Hillary, Ellery Hale is best known by the public for the Mount Palomar telescope, which is named after him, the Hale telescope. But he had a genius for raising money. He was born into a fairly well-to-do family, uh, as was Percival Lowell for that matter. And he raised money continuously for, uh, to develop observatories. Amongst the people that worked at uh, Wilson Observatory is Edward Hubble. Edwin Hubble, you may have heard of from the famous telescope that's floating around our planet. Uh, in orbit and taking pictures of a solar system and deep space objects. Hubble discovered a number of things using the telescopes at the uh, Mount Wilson Observatory, among them what's known as the redshift. That is, you've heard of Doppler when a train goes by and you go, Meow. that kind of thing also happens with light waves. And if the redshift is, is prominent, that means the object is coming towards us. And if it's blue, it means the object is going away from us. And based on those particular criteria, he began to measure the size of the universe. And he discovered, amongst other things, that the universe is expanding. And that fit right into a, a theory by a man named Einstein, who also said that space itself is expanding. Not the objects in between, but space itself is expanding. How he does that, it requires that kind of math that I can't do. 
Now, his genius for raising money led him to build four of the most magnificent, largest telescopes in the world in turn. The 40 inch Yerkes refractor is the largest refractor ever made. And the reason for that is simply that the lensing is so heavy that they, they couldn't build it, uh, make the lens any larger. He built the 60 inch Mount Wilson reflector, which we'll look at tonight. At that time, it was the largest scope in the world. And then he built a 100 inch Mount Wilson reflector, the Hooker telescope. And that too was the largest telescope in the world until he built the 200 inch at Palomar, which was the largest for a number of years after that. He also was a pioneer in solar astronomy. Uh, on the mountain itself today is the 150 foot tower solar scope and the 60 foot tower solar scope and the snow solar scope, all of which have led to our current understanding of how the sun operates and keeps the earth and the rest of the planets going. Uh, and on us, it's uh, alive, we depend on it. It's a rugged trip up there. And they first started considering building an observatory in the 19th century. And you can see the road that comes up there now. Well, they had to do that by horseback. They had rough trails, if trails at all. The mountain is nearly 6,000 feet high and the San Gabriel's next to uh, Pasadena where Pasadena is now. Pasadena didn't exist then. So it was a rugged trip to get up there and Hale and his colleagues loved it, but it took a while to get the money and it took a while to build it because they had to carry everything up by horseback and or wagon. The observatory is still closed because of the pandemic. I checked into the site uh, a little while ago and uh, they're, they're beginning to lay plans for opening it up again. That's good. First thing you see as you come up the mountain is this stack of antennae. Uh, there's radio, television, and all kinds of things having to do with astronomy that no one in our tour uh, explained but it's pretty impressive once you get there because it's a very big array. And over to the left, you see a little white dot. That's one of the domes. I'm not sure if it's the 100 inch or the 60 inch, but it's one of the telescope domes. And the next thing you see coming around the mountain are the telescopes that are solar oriented. The one on the left was being used by a series of students the one on the right, and there's only one, it's two different photos of the same edifice, uh, was closed at that time. Although my reading has suggested that they are using it again uh, for university research and public demonstrations. Now, when we got there, there was a limit of 14 participants. When we got there, uh, Mr. Michael Rudy at left was our tour guide and he was charming and knowledgeable and very interested in doing what he was doing. He liked showing off the telescopes in the observatory. The dome that we're walking towards is the dome for the 60 inch telescope, which is here. Now you see the fellow in the top left, ZZ top beard and all that, He's a retired astrophysicist, and he was a special treat, apparently, because uh, Mr. Rudy talked him into doing this, and uh, he was knowledgeable to the point of we didn't want him to stop talking. I'm at the bottom left there waiting to take a peek in there. We were early. The sun hadn't set yet, so... We took a peek at Venus in the daytime, and that was it for that telescope. But you see just above his head in the picture on the right, you see that little blue tube? That is part of the eyepiece mechanism that was designed for the scope. 
the 60 inch and the 100 inch were not visual telescopes. They were both designed to take photographs of deep space and planets, but they had no facility for taking eye or for eye viewing. They had to make special arrangements for that. Now, it's a pretty big device. Uh, you can see Mr. Thompson there, he's um, probably six foot tall. And that, uh, what is that, 20, 25 feet high? You can see why visual use it might be difficult. They have to make special arrangements. They have ladders and things that you climb on. And we didn't have to do that because we didn't stay with the scope that long. But the neat thing about this telescope is, is you can rent it. Only $1,050 a half night, $1,700 for a full night for up to 25 people. So you divide that up, it's not too bad a deal. And they provide a guy uh, to run the telescope and, and point it at the things you want to look at and help you take photographs if you want to photograph. Now, let's we'll skip that. Now, we from there, we moved to the 100-inch, and it is much, much larger. After seeing that 60-inch, my God, we looked at this thing, and it was enormous. Uh, you can rent this one, by the way. $2,700 for a half night, $5,000 for a full night. Uh, such a deal. But it is a deal. It's the only telescope, I think, in the world where the public can have access to a device of this quality. Uh, you have to pay a little bit for it, but if you have the money and if you have the interest, it's a deal. Now, we had a lunch provided. It's the best, most expensive $300 lunch I've ever had. The best part of it was that the tour was free. The lunch was turkey sandwich, cookies, potato chips, and salad, almost as good as my wife makes. And we took about a half hour to enjoy that before uh, letting the sun go down enough to where we could start looking through the telescope. Now, we had a, a list of things to look at. Uh, participant here is standing on a ladder looking through the eyepiece. Again, a specially designed optical system for the telescope. And over to the right is uh, Norm Vargas. He is the specialist who would set up the coordinates for the telescope to move to object to object. That is a skill in its own right. Amateur telescopes have what they call setting circles. Uh, to find the coordinates in the sky, except that's been replaced now by computer designations and you use a computer to do it. But here's our list. And uh, some of it probably doesn't mean anything unless you're in astronomy. But the spectacular things that I remember seeing were looking at Saturn at NGC 6572 called the Blue Racquetball Nebula. Uh, NGC is National General or New General Catalog. Uh, it was designed by a man, J.L. Dreyer, in the 1900s. He listed hundreds and hundreds of stellar objects and gave them a number. And his catalog is still in use and has been enhanced uh, over the years, I believe, but it's still one of the principal location uh, references. The other is the Metzier catalog. Uh, you see those designated as M57. Oops, M57 uh, or M13. That's Messier. Now, those are these photographs here, uh, all most of which are Hubble. The Ring Nebula, M57, we saw that and it did not look like this. It was smaller, but it had the same colors. And you could see the two central stars. It was 
a mind blower for people who have just seen it in photographs all their life, like me. Uh, below is Saturn. This was imaged through the 60 inch scope uh, by, I believe she's an amateur, but maybe she's a professional given the credit that's on the photo itself. She works uh, on behalf of uh, Wilson, Mount Wilson Observatory, and this was on that site. It's a pretty good photograph, and it's almost exactly what I saw through that 100 inch. Uh, the other scope or the other images here, uh, the Hercules M13 is a globular cluster. What a globular cluster is, is a bunch of stars that have not become spiral. That is a spiral gal galaxy. Uh, I'm not sure why they configure this way, but the M13 Hercules glob is one of the most spectacular in all the sky and is the first uh, that new astronomers go to see. And the other one is nicknamed the blue racquetball. You can see that little blue circle in the middle. Uh, these are all called planetary nebulae, the ring nebula and the uh, racquetball one. Uh, they have to do with novas going completely. And these are all gas remnants uh, after the fact. This is uh, Mr. Hubble. He's uh, setting up a camera on the 100 inch to take some photographs. This is a, a photo from the Wilson archives. And this is a photo of that the 60 foot tower with, uh, you can see the mirror instruments at the top. The light is from the sun is reflected down through the channels of that. You see that square tubing that goes down through the girders, it goes down to the bottom where they photograph the image or draw the image, or even just look at the image. And this is Pasadena as seen from Mount Wilson at night. This is the very definition of light pollution. There's an organization in the world called International Dark Skies, and they, their mission is to convince cities that they don't have to have this kind of lighting to be a city at night. Uh, some cities are already like, making those adaptions. Ironically enough, uh, Arizona well, conservative as it is in many ways, has led the way in, in converting to dark sky city attributes where they have like street lights will have covers on the top so the light doesn't go up, but just goes around the ambient area necessary. Uh, and it makes a big difference. So Lowell Observatory, I have to admit, is, is my favorite place. Uh, I've been there three times, and I hope to make it another time. Uh, it's in Flagstaff, Arizona, a university town that uh, very much resembles the feel of Berkeley, uh, when Berkeley isn't agitated in political causes. Uh, it's comfortable. It's... Uh, pleasant to be there. When you go to the Lowell Observatory, you enter through the Steel Visitor Center, and you'll see immediately Starry Skies Shop, where you can buy souvenirs, telescopes, binoculars, um, meteorites. Um, my wife has a collection of three meteorites, one of which is from the Arizona crater. And books and uh, other kinds of things that are appeal to astronomy and tourists and the like. It also has an interactive uh, education center. Uh, there are buttons to push that will give you lectures on the items that you're looking at. Um, or you can spend, what, hours there looking and, and learning from the things that are available. Now, the great meteorite in Arizona 
crashed 50,000 years ago. And Lowell Observatory, the observatory has the chunk at the right. It's pretty good size. It's about a foot and a half to two feet wide. And the one on the left is on display at Meteor Crater itself. They're both from the same impact. Uh, the impactor, the asteroid that hit the planet 50,000 years ago, was believed to be 150 feet across. So you, this is what's left. You can get an idea of uh, what might have been like. Most of the tours start with what they call now the rotunda. It used to be a library and office space for the astronomers working. Uh, Pluto's discoverer, Tom, uh, Clyde Tombaugh, had a room there where he would sleep at night and then go to work at his uh, telescope. This is what it looks like inside. It's it's a beautiful room. I love it. And they use it for classrooms and lectures. And there are displays on the walls uh, of various aspects of the historical importance of Lowell Observatory. You'll see that light at the top. It's gorgeous. It's just simply gorgeous. Halfway, well, Richard. Thank you. Uh, the rotunda has a number of displays. And this one uh, features Tom uh, Clyde Tombaugh's discovery of Pluto, a once upon a time planet de recently demoted to dwarf planet. They have a lot of interactive uh, family oriented events. Uh, here on the left, you see a telescope and these folks are looking at Venus in the daytime. It can be seen if you know where to look with the naked eye and you can look it up on the telescope as well. Uh, there's a family at the right looking at it. And then below uh, another small group fellow is pointing to where you can see it with the naked eye. This tour guide is showing a flock of students, the sun, the special telescope there is designed to see the prominences without burning your eyes. It, in effect, acts like a solar eclipse. It blocks out the central portion of the sun, and that gives access to the prominences and any solar flares that might be bursting off the rim of the sun. Now, the downside is you don't get to see sunspots generally with this kind of telescope. You need a regular telescope with a filter that blocks out enough light that it doesn't burn your eyes, but then you can see the sunspots. So it's a part and part. Now, same tour guys getting ready to lead us to the uh, rotunda. And uh, she's oriented, orienting us uh, to, as to where we're going to go. And we're heading at this point towards the 24 inch refractor that was Percival Lowell's big uh, instrument of, of fame. It's a, made by Alvin Clark, who was the foremost optician of his time. The Yerkes Observatory refractor was also an Alvin Clark uh, telescope. And uh, there was a six inch that Lowell used before uh, he got the observatory actually going. Now, just to give you a perspective, these are photographs of Mars circa about 1950 taken with the Palomar telescope. You can see the lack of resolution and the lack of detail. Uh, they were shot in different filters of light. Blue shows one thing. Uh, allows them the atmosphere and clouds and so forth. And red shows surface features, but none of them show in very great detail. Percival Lowell has another claim to fame. You've heard of the canals of Mars and every science fiction movie featuring Mars seems to have made some reference to canals on Mars. Percival Lowell thought he saw what he called channels or canali 
which is Italian, uh, forgive my pronunciation, uh, Italian for channels. But uh, it turns out that they were not channels or canals, but he devoted his life to trying to prove that there was life on Mars. And this is one of hundreds of images that he hand drew through using the 24 inch refractor. Now this is Mars through the Hubble telescope. You can see the difference in the uh, detail and the progress that we have made technologically. It is a mind blower for those of us who've been following this, well, since the third grade. Now, the second tour that I made to Lowell, uh, they had dismantled the telescope, the 24 inch Clark, and were refurbishing it. This is the stand upon which the telescope would have been shown. Uh, these guys are working on it, replacing parts, uh, repairing parts, painting parts. Uh, took a year or more to recondition the entire mass. And you'll notice something interesting, I think. There was no electricity during the time of the US telescope was used. So they got Ford to donate tires. These are all Ford tires and they rotate the dome when you pull a big long pole attached to the dome. It was all by hand and you had to have some amount of strength to pull it around. Uh, now, it, I believe it is electrified since the reconstruction, but uh, they replaced any rotten wood uh, or repaired any broken struts and support uh, girders, uh, make it look very nice. And this is the guide, our guide that day was the lady in red and we're heading for the workshop where they're repairing and, and uh, enhancing the telescope. The tubes have been dis disassembled and they're being refinished uh, from the smallest little bearings, either remade or polished or repaired to large mountings. These are the axis for the equatorial mount that allows the telescope to follow the stars because it is aligned with the axis of the earth. And the rotation of the earth, as I'm sure you know, uh, is what res is responsible for the skies rising in the east and setting in the west. And the equatorial mount follows that. In this day and age, we use electricity to, to govern the, the speeds and uh, the sightings. But in those days, they had to do it by hand. And there are a lot of little levers on the scope that uh, helps you do that. Now, on the way back from uh, the repair shop, this is where Percival Lowell is buried. Uh, it was built a few years after his death in 1916, uh, and they moved him in there uh, so that he could be on the grounds and near the scopes that he lived his life for. And here we are back at the dome ready to enter. Emily again, uh, she's showing us one of the wheels that is used in connection with rotating the dome, not a tire. And you can see that she has a pretty good feel. These folks were entranced, as was I. And there's a red light at the bottom. Uh, at nighttime, only red light is used inside of an observatory dome because it does not interfere with your night vision. White light or any other color wavelength will ruin your light vision, night vision uh, for up to a half an hour and you can't see the fainter objects you're trying to see. So red light prevails and it casts a kind of an eerie glow. I've used red light and it requires some amount of adaptation. 
Now, you can see all these little wheels and so forth on the end of the telescope. Uh, they're all designed to move the telescope with the sky, to focus, uh, to adjust, and in some instances to set up for photography. It's a complex piece and it takes a while to learn how to use it, I'm sure. And this is what it looks like when it's put back together. It is magnificent. Uh, I, I realize the photo doesn't quite convey just the impact that it has. Uh, but boy, it is really impactful. If you have a chance, if you're in Arizona, I highly recommend a visit to the Lowell Observatory. Now, the other claim to fame that Lowell has is this is where Pluto was discovered. Percival Lowell noticed that there were little wiggles in the orbits of planets Uranus and Neptune, the two outermost of the planets at the time. These wiggles, he assumed, was due to the gravitation pull of a ninth planet, uh, planet X. And he spent years himself looking for it, but didn't find it. And this young man was 24 uh, at the time he sent some drawings he'd made to Lowell Observatory. The drawings he'd made through a telescope that he himself had built. And Lowell was impressed enough and his colleagues were impressed enough that they offered him a job. And his job was to look for the 10th planet. And he was hired in around 1929, I think it was. That was when that telescope that he used was built. And he I mentioned that he had a, a, his sleeping quarters in the rotunda. And this is the path from the rotunda to the telescope about an eighth of a mile that he made every day, well, every night. And right now they have these signs. Each one represents a planet and is in proportion distance to from the sun here closest to us all the way out to the Pluto, which is where the observatory is. And this distance becomes staggering uh, towards the end. It's not a very big dome uh, compared to the others. Uh, and it was all rock work and, and mortar, uh, amazing design. Uh, we plunged on in to see the telescope that he discovered the planet with. Now here's the deal. It's a telescope, but you can't look through it. It's called an astrograph and it's designed specifically to take star pictures uh, perhaps even uh, closer planet pictures, but 13 inches gave him uh, a wide lens, gave him plenty of opportunity to take time-lapse photographs looking for that planet. The plates that he used were huge. They were 14 inches by 17 inches, and they were glass. Uh, which was the nature of photographic plates back in the in that day. Uh, the guide here is talking about the red light and the scope and shows us the plate mechanism that he used for his photographs. And as you can see, it's pretty good size. And each night he'd take these photographs, each one an hour long, and then he'd have to develop them. And then uh, a week later, he would begin to compare the photographs that he'd take with each other. He'd repeat a photograph every week of the same exact distance and then compare it on what was called a Zeiss blink comparator. And what that did was it takes, took the two plates and you flash back and forth on them and if you're very careful and you're observing, you will see one of those little dots move back and forth. And that is a planet. 17 by 14, there's hundreds, perhaps thousands of star images. And he's looking for one 
that moves. And this is it. This is just a chunk of that big plate. And I think you can see the red arrow. That is Pluto. And you can see how it moved in a week's time. And that's how he discovered it. This is Pluto taken by New Horizons probe uh, a few months, a couple of years ago. And the detail is marvelous is from like, oh, what? I think about 22,000 miles away, uh, hugely detailed. The one on the top right, that is its largest satellite. Didn't know Pluto had satellites until uh, an observer on Earth found one and named it Charon. Now there's controversy about how to pronounce that. And I looked it up several times and there's three ways that are correct. It depends on who's saying it. Uh, it can be Karen, it can be Charon, and it can be Sharon. I like Karen myself, uh, but that's a personal choice saying. These are all NASA photographs, uh, public domain, and as is anything photographed by NASA is. You know, today, if we discovered a new planet, we'd probably get some publicity, but you know, with the internet and television and the various media, uh, it's not as big a deal, I think, worldwide as it was back in 1930. This was world news. Every country in the world that had civilization, not civilization, had a, a technical aspect to their, their country appreciated and applauded this discovery. You now, Tombo was only 24 when he went to work at Lowell, and he was well, 25 when he made his discovery. And from there, he continued his researches. He discovered uh, at least 100 asteroids in orbit around the uh, sun. Uh, he discovered one comet. Uh, and at some point, he got drafted and went to World War II and returned and went to work in a university uh, down south. I don't have that name, but uh, he finished his career as a university professor. Now, here's that fellow showing us uh, all that plate work. But the point is, you can see the people. Uh, I think they are fascinated, as I was, by what he is showing us. Uh, there was an apocryphal story by one guide uh, who said that Tombo was so dedicated to his work that he was in the middle of photographing and, and dealing with the telescope that he actually let a finger freeze and he lost the finger. Now, this guy said that it wasn't true, but I like the story anyway. I don't know if it's true or not. Uh, and I can't find any confirmation one way or the other, but it does suggest that astronomers are a different breed. Now, the naming of Pluto was also an international thing. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of suggestions came uh, over to Lowell Observatory and some of them are pretty strange. One was uh, over here on the left, uh, who wanted to name it Jean after her two-year-old daughter, Planet Jean, and then Lolatha, which is Lowell of Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, anagram. Uh, that didn't go. And someone suggested Zixamol, which you know, he suggested that was the last word in the dictionary. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but uh, Pluto was the final choice, and Pluto was suggested by this young lady, Venetia Burney, an English school child, who actually had a knowledge of uh, Roman mythology and noticed that, that the planets and satellites mostly had been named from Roman mythology figures, 
and she figured that um, Pluto fit right in, and the powers that be agreed with her. And then when Charon was discovered, uh, that fit right in because Charon is one of the boatmen that conveyed the dead to the underworld called where Pluto reigned. So it all fit right in. Uh, she died at the age of 90 and was always modest about her contribution, but kind of thrilled. Uh, and I'd be jumping up and down. And that's about it. Uh, if I've got a whole bunch of uh, references on the tail end. So since this is being recorded and you can pick it up on YouTube at some point, uh, you can look at these references and do further investigation if you would like to do that. Uh, and actually, uh, you can contact me on my Facebook page, uh, and, and I'd be happy to send the information to you. So, Stephanie, Constance? Thank you. Uh, great, great program. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to put them in the question and answer box um, and I can read them out so that we can get answers. Um, let's see if anybody's got anything to ask. Hello. Someone <laughs> says that was utterly amazing. Cindy says that was utterly amazing. Thank you. Oh, we have a question here. What was what's the largest telescope now? I don't know the dimensions, but on the Keck telescope in Hawaii, uh, it is the largest, I believe. Uh, it is essentially what's called an interferometer. It takes several different mirrors and uses the computer base to integrate the images of those mirrors so that instead of a hundred inch telescope, you have five mirrors that are a hundred inches and combined they end up being five or 600 inches in diameter, uh, which could not be done in a single mirror because of the weight issue. Uh, on Mount Wilson, in fact, there's a new telescope, a new interferometer that I just discovered that uh, has, I think, six one meter mirrors, which gives it an effective radius of six meters, uh, which is 20 feet or so. Uh, it's acts as a single telescope and brings all the images in together. I just discovered about it a couple of days ago and I'm going to do some more research on that. Uh, the most powerful of course is, is the Hubble telescope in orbit. It's not that big, but it doesn't have the handicap of the Earth's atmosphere. The Earth's atmosphere blurs images with the heat waves rising uh, interestingly enough, however, computer science has made a detecting, detection device that allows compensation for the Earth's atmosphere so that it doesn't interfere the way it used to. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, it measures the, the wiggles in the atmosphere and compensates for them in the device itself an amazing technological advance. Um, have you ever been to the Hale Telescope in San Diego? I have not. Uh, I somehow missed that. Um, I, would, I look forward to it. There's also the Lick Telescope in Northern California, which I have not been to, and it's not that far away. Uh, my trip uh, to Wilson was courtesy of my wife uh, I owe her tons for that. My trip to uh, Lowell Observatory 
was on a, in passing to my hometown in Colorado. And I loved it so much that I kept going by that way whenever I could. Um, I had hoped to do the meteor crater in Arizona as well, but time prevented that. But maybe next time. Uh, it's only about 40 miles from Flagstaff, and it's worth the side trip. It's a hole in the ground. It is huge. It is amazing to see. Uh, photographs just do not do it justice. Um, Betty asks, says, great program. Loved all the history. Which other telescopes would you like to see? Have you heard of the one in Hawaii, which you were just talking about, I guess? Yeah. Are there any telescopes you wish to get to see? I would like to go to Mount Palomar. Uh, I would like to go to uh, the Lick Observatory. And there's a telescope uh, in France called Pic du Midi uh, that I would like to go to. I don't know if they allow visitors there, but it's way up in the mountains and it's uh, a primary research facility in Europe. Um, there's also the Griffith uh, refractor 12 inch, I think it is in the Griffith Park uh, that is open to the public and the people in uh, Los Angeles area can go there and, and they have regular um, viewing nights uh, where you can go watch. It, of course, the, the pandemic has is, is shaded all of these activities for a while, but uh, I'm hoping that it'll all open up pretty soon. Um, Scott says, why didn't you mention your connection to Blue Racquetball? Say again? Why didn't you mention your connection to Blue Racquetball? Uh, was it really the topic? <laughs> <laughs> That's Scott. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> I did not name that, that nebula, and it's really a nickname, but it is listed on, on that sheet as Blue Racquetball mm -hmm. because of that central thing. Uh, which is one of the reasons I, I searched for that photograph. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I used to teach racquetball uh -huh. and play racquetball along with this fellow Scott uh, <laughs> many years ago. Um, Bill says, I read in the news that Hubble is having end of life issues. Have you heard anything about the next generation of orbital or lunar based scopes? There is one being built. Uh, I, for, I don't recall the name of it. It is going to be launched in the next couple, three years, if everything goes right. And it should uh, do to Hubble what Hubble did to Earth-based telescopes, almost make it obsolete. Hubble was supposed to uh, be decommissioned a few years ago but its contributions and the money involved in, in building it in the first place convinced folks that it's worth repairing. And they did that. They up enhanced it uh, with new equipment, replaced things that were breaking down. And again, it is getting tired. Um, I, I have seen a headline or two that it's, it's got some problems but they're still repairing it. And as long as they can, I'm sure they'll keep using it. It is so uh, singularly broken. Oh my gosh. Our understanding into new levels of, of science. Uh, the photographs uh, that it is pulled out is just amazing. There's one called uh, the uh, deep field photograph that was taken over a period of hundreds of hours. The target is the normally blank, but what it shows is thousands of galaxies in that one little square all the way to the edge of the universe that we understand. Uh, thousands of galaxies, each one like our Milky Way with hundreds of thousands of stars in each one. Now, get into the theory, uh, one would expect out there somewhere, there's at least another planet with life. You would anticipate the odds. The problem is, is 
it's unlikely that they all occur at the same time, which is why we can't find them. They either disappeared or they haven't been born yet. So it's an interesting conundrum. Good question. Uh, Dan says, thank you so much for including us. Your knowledge is amazing. We will meet you in early August. <laughs> <laughs> and that is our last question. I'll All right, Richard. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. As, as usual, you know your subject and uh, you gave us a lot of information and a lot of things to think about. Well, uh, there are on the, as I say, a lot of references at the tail end of this. Uh, I, I should have checked with you first, but um, I think if we, it gets posted on YouTube again, uh, it will be available for people to check into and, and get a hold of those references. That's correct. It will be posted um, shortly. And uh, it is recorded and will be posted and I will give Richard the information and it will appear on our library website under virtual events. Well, so I wanna thank you all for your help and, and your interest. Uh, Stephania and Constance, you were solid in the library and you have my devotion forever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Richard. That's very sweet. Well, I do want to remind people that uh, we have another art, uh, another Remarkable Journeys program um, scheduled for next month on Thursday, July 15th at 7 p.m. And Pam Rogers will present a program called uh, Japan, the Heart of Honshu. And she will talk about her um, her remarkable journey along with her husband. They traveled in Japan and she will uh, give us uh, some information about that country. So please join us. Thank you again, Richard. Thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate it. Good night. Good night. Good night.